started. Um, before we begin the webinar, I just want to, to recap a few um, housekeeping um, things with you. So just very quickly before we get started, just so you know, participant audio and video are disabled. So don't worry, we can't hear you. You won't accidentally come off um, and onto mic. Um, but we do want to hear from you in other ways. And so you can post questions um, in the Q&A function at any time. So at the bottom of your screen, you'll see Q&A. Um, so please do make the most of that and submit your questions to us. Um, we really want to hear from you. The session is being recorded. Um, and as with all of our webinars, you can find the recordings on the INE website and they'll be shared widely afterwards. Closed captioning is also available in English and you can find that at the bottom of your screen. Um, so please do access that. Um, and lastly, um, as I say, the recording and presentations will be shared on the INE website. Um, so do take a look at those. Um, but welcome everybody. Um, we're really excited about the agenda today and it's a busy one. So I'm going to keep these remarks very, very brief. I just want to do a formal welcome on behalf of INEE um, and UNICEF. This is a co-organized, co-hosted webinar and we're really grateful for that collaboration. Um, and if we just move to the next slide, um, just a reminder that you're here for a webinar focusing on um, early childhood education and really thinking about solutions for pre-primary education in these very complex times. This webinar is part of a series um, that has been running um, since March, focusing on COVID-19 and practical tools, resources, strategies um, for colleagues working in education and emergencies and education practitioners. You can, on the INE website, find recordings of those webinars along with helpful tools and resources to support you at this time. And please feel free to reach out to us here at INE at any time um, with any ideas, suggestions, but also to access anything you, might, you need um, to support your work in the research. Response. But I'm, I'm going to keep it brief today because I'm very excited to introduce a guest moderator um, here for us in this webinar, um, Joan Lombardi, who I think many of you will know for her incredible work over many, many years in this um, space, in this area of work. Joan directs Early Opportunities LLC, a strategic advisement service focused on the development of young children, families and the communities that support them. In addition, she's a senior scholar at the Centre for Child and Human Development at, at Georgetown University, where she focuses on global early childhood initiatives and that's just a, a, a tiny snapshot of what she does um, but we're really grateful to have her today so I'm going to hand over to Joan and leave you in capable hands but welcome everyone and thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much Charlotte and I want to send my greetings to everyone around the world who was able to join us. I want to start by expressing my sincere gratitude to both INI and UNICEF for their thoughtfulness in putting this event together today. Our goal is really twofold. First, to give visibility to the needs of young children during the emergency and to learn from each other by sharing concrete examples about how people around the world are responding to the pandemic and assuring that early education of young children continues. I want to first start by sharing what the day will, uh, the session will look like if we can go to the agenda. Um, we are going to really have two panels. Um, we have a lot of information to share. We're very excited about it. I'll give a brief overview, but then go right into the panel. The first panel will give us four field examples. The Makani Centers and from UNICEF Jordan community-based early childhood in Chad and IAC will be presenting, COVID-19 responses in Latin America from Sesame Workshop, and learning at home campaign and the learning passport from UNICEF Ukraine. We'll then take a break, open it up for some questions before we come back and talk a little bit about the guidance on reopening pre-primary learning spaces with the guidance coming from the Global Education Cluster. And then again, we'll come back for, for some questions. So if we could move to the next slide. I think we all uh, know that the global community came together to make a commitment to quality early childhood education, that all girls and boys should be assured access to quality early childhood development care and pre-primary so that they are ready for primary. It was an important goal that we'll all get behind. If we go to the next slide, I think what we know pre-COVID, if we could go, 
Pre-COVID, this was the situation. Nearly half of the world's pre-primary age children were still not in, enrolled in the pre-primary education that we had hoped for when we established the, um, that 4.2 goal. If we look at low-income countries, it's one out of five children. So it's a very different situation depending on where you are around the world. If we go to the next slide, we see that about a quarter of the world's pre-primary children live in countries affected by emergencies. <clears throat> Yet in those countries, only one in three children are currently enrolled. If we go to the next slide, we all know that what started happening in February, March, depending on where you were, um, UNESCO began to uh, track what school closings were going on around the world. This was the picture in February. We know that it grew to over one and a half billion children being out of school, including millions and millions of children that were entering pre-primary school. If we go to the next slide, uh, UNICEF recently put out some data that shows what countries did in response to school closings with regard to remote learning policies. And you can see the column on the left is the pre-primary area. 60% of the, the countries responding uh, indicated that they had done some remote learning um, in the country for the pre-primary children. It was interesting because radio was actually the least um, utilized for that age group. However, if we go to the next slide, what we'll see when we look at all levels and what mechanisms for learning they were using in <clears throat> low-income countries, we had much less access to internet and much more access to radio um, in for the pre-primary, uh, during the pre-primary years. So all of this, I think, brings home the digital divide that's so affecting children around the world, along with the other issues that they're facing uh, regarding access to food, stress on families. And I, I just want to give a, a thank you before we turn it over to the speakers for everyone around the world that is working on behalf of families with young children who are on, under such tremendous pressure. So with that, let me turn to our first speaker. Um, we have two speakers from UNICEF Jordan, Sajeda Atari and Eduardo Garcia Roland. So take it away in Jordan. Thank you so much, John. Um, I believe Eduardo is also here. Uh, so my name is uh, my name is Sajda Atari, and I'm an ECD specialist working with UNICEF Jordan, uh, but currently based in Doha for an assignment. Um, Eduardo, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Eduardo, and I am based in Amman. I am the early childhood specialist uh, uh, here in Jordan. So thank early, you so much. Early. Yes. Early childhood, Early childhood education. education. <laughs> yes, so good to be here with you. Uh, so uh, I think in very uh, in the coming few minutes, we're going to try to brief you about some of the work that um, has been done in response to um, COVID-19. Um, uh, we have two programs. I think if we can go to the next slide, um, we're going to be um, talking about the parenting response. And I, I started the presentation with, uh, with a question that maybe some people would question WhatsApp as not being a platform designed for either parenting support or distance learning, which uh, I think we all uh, uh, underestimated the, um, uh, how um, technology and uh, social media can be a great mean to receive, uh, to, to reach uh, people um, in, 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 a, in a, a very useful way. And I think uh, this is what we have done uh, uh, immediately um, after the lockdown. And I think 
in Jordan, we are lucky because um, we have a, a very long standing experience and well established networks related to parenting programs. So over, you know, 20 years. And what happened is that at the, the onset of the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, the Jordan country office was able immediately to support setting up community based WhatsApp groups for parents, which was facilitated by ECD facilitators and community volunteers from Makani. And Makani is a program that serves the most vulnerable population in, in the country, including the Syrian refugees and, and Jordanian. And um, it's actually one of the largest programs of its kind in, in Jordan for young children and their families. So as we said here is that although the uh, WhatsApp by itself is not meant for um, for programs like parenting or um, early um, or, or education in general, we were able to um, utilize it to reach thousands of parents in um, in that uh, difficult time. If we going to going to next slide, um, what happened is that um, in Jordan we have free parenting uh, programs that are supported by uh, UNICEF. So we were able in a very short time period to um, uh, adapt the, uh, these parenting programs and uh, uh, extract um, um, messages and con content that was uh, uh, targeting parents of children um, aged uh, zero to um, five. Um, we were sending messages that included um, um, age appropriate home based learning activities, uh, children's songs, stories, in addition, of course, to the key component, which is uh, messages for parents on positive parenting and stress management um, that was even targeting parents of uh, children all ages from zero to 19. So this uh, uh, um, utilizing existing uh, resources was a life savior in, in such a very difficult time. Um, going to the next slide, uh, what we have done in in a nutshell is that we uh, were sending messages to parents. So every day the parents would receive uh, three to four um, messages uh, in the form of short videos. The videos uh, are either 30 or or um, uh, 30 seconds to two minutes. And um, then they would receive a corresponding text message with the video script. And uh, we were providing the text and the videos so that you know parents who are not able to download, for example, the, the messages would even either, uh, either receive it in the form of a video or as, or as a text message or sometime as a voice message. As you will see, these messages were uh, going to families on a certain time. And I I think sending the messages at the same exact time every day was very important and uh, helpful for parents to set up a daily routine that they were looking forward to um, receive these uh, messages. Um, uh, to, to the, the videos had songs and, as I said, um, stories for young children, parenting tips, and in addition to learning activities. And each day, the parents would receive learning activities that they would implement with their children, then video them and send them back to the WhatsApp groups. I think what was important, what is important to uh, tell about that these WhatsApp groups were, you know, um, two-way communication between parents and facilitators. So a number of parents would be grouped and wor be working with a certain facilitator over a period of time, and then they would, you know, go into discussions, implement with their children, and then post back to the group, and and so on. Um, I think um, that the last um, um, slide uh, shows that we have taken this idea uh, further and we have utilized um, your report and uh, what's up for business if we can go to the next slide uh, to uh, reach a wider number of uh, group through disseminating messages on positive parenting uh, with the uh, UNICEF Jordan and partners uh, a platform that is called Usrati or my family was uh, established on um, using WhatsApp for business so the families would have access to information and tips on a daily basis and uh, some of the content was uh, uh, customized to be related to COVID-19 in addition to the daily tips. And on um, the last Thursday of every week, we receive evaluation from parents. But I think the, different, the difference between this uh, project and the, the previous one is that this one is more as um, a one-way communication where parents only are recipients of the content, while with the community-based um, WhatsApp groups, the parents had more chance to 
participate and share and learn and exchange experiences. Um, I'm trying to be very quick so that I can give time to Eduardo to uh, talk about the education part. Eduardo, you can go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Sajida. So as you see, uh, what we did here is, and Sajida explained, we have this, uh, this parenting programs uh, very quickly, like immediately, and we were able to, to respond very quickly to help parents, basically, to help their children. Uh, the, but obviously, nobody was really expecting something like COVID, an emergency of such a scale, and definitely was not the Ministry of Education, like probably in all your countries. Uh, the Ministry of Education did encourage the teachers to continue communication with the, with the students and, and with their parents to just yes, carry on, on, on learning. Uh, but that was really just, uh, in many ways, always also wishful thinking, right? But uh, for this summer, the Ministry of Education created a, a, distance, uh, a distance curriculum for a school readiness program. And I'm going to tell you a little bit how we implemented with a partner also here in refugee camps. And I think the way of implementation also raises questions uh, and on lessons in many ways in a way that Sajida also, also described in the lessons and the learning that we have uh, uh, acquired during the last months of, of lockdown. So the curriculum was, uh, was done very quickly uh, by the Ministry of Education. It was just for two weeks and concentrated in numeracy and literacy skills, something very basic. But uh, this remote curriculum was uh, designed for doing it remotely exclusively, uh, but we were able to enhance a little bit the, the way we implement the curriculum based on our experience and our, our learning also over the previous months. So there were 1,300, uh, a lot of refugee uh, children in, in, this, in, uh, in the refugee camps, the ones who are going to enter grade one. Uh, we also trained their parents or caregivers, 950 uh, parents were trained in, in advance to, in, in child protection to also being aware of, uh, of uh, neglect, abuse, exploitation, and being aware of also how they could respond to that, the, the, uh, uh, to, those, to those situations. And we counted on trained educators. Uh, they were not necessarily kindergarten teachers, but they were already trained educators that were retrain. Um, so this brings also the important questions on who you target, the importance of including parents, obviously, and, and to have also people who are trained to do this uh, distance learning. Uh, the two weeks curriculum was extended a little bit more and was uh, combined with some enhancement that I think were key and important, which were home visits. Uh, which are expensive, and, and there is a question of how scalable, scalable this is if you want to have, like, a, for example, a whole year curriculum, a real school year curriculum uh, uh, with distance learning. There was printed material, which was important because many people do not have access to technological platforms or they have limited access, like they have a telephone, but uh, there are other things that they have to do with the telephone. This gives also flexibility on timing. Uh, and uh, they, they would use WhatsApp the same way that Sajida has mentioned. Uh, so that was very much interactive. And uh, when there are someone who doesn't have a, 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 a computer or a phone, which uh, we know that there is more than 20% in the refugee camps, we, uh, we conceive this peer support. So you can use the phone of a neighbor that is in the same, in the same, uh, in the same program, or that way you're, you're sure that everyone has access to that. Uh, so there was a lot of interaction and the platform, as Sajida said, it's not only uh, that, uh, I mean, it maybe the, it was not, uh, it was not uh, conceived to, to, for education, but actually allow for a lot of interaction. So there are hundreds of videos from the parents that show how the, 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 the children are working, hundreds of, of audios also asking questions, receiving answers, uh, which it's incredibly uh, supportive. And I just wanted to show the last, uh, the last uh, slide for you to see the four areas where the curriculum was uh, concentrated on that uh, gives uh, some idea on the things that you have to think about. Uh, and the next slide, you will see literacy and numeracy on the, on the left side, literacy on, the right, on, the le on, the, on the left side, so you can learn how to say duck in Arabic, bata. And uh, we, we were also looking at 
also social interactions and, and uh, you can see this dexterity, dexterity is, um, skills there, doing lines, doing coloring. And the fourth thing was also messages. Uh, you see, I'm particularly keen on the one of, uh, of dental hygiene because it's uh, a big problem in the refugee camps. And uh, obviously there were also messages around hygiene and, and COVID. So there was a lot to, to, uh, to talk about, but this interaction with the parents and the support of the, of the, of the facilitators, trained facilitators uh, really help and gives lessons for moving similar blending learning distance uh, uh, programs to the future. Thank you everyone. Greetings from Aman. Thank you, Sajida and um, Eduardo. There are several questions in the chat um, especially about the WhatsApp features and how you determined certain times of the day that you use. So you may want to look at those Q&As. Again, reminding everybody you can put your questions in the Q&A function and then you'll get written answers back from the respondents. A lot to talk about from Jordan. Um, let's move on to the field experiences of IAC, um, Katie J. Scott will be presenting about Little Ripples. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm based in Los Angeles, so early morning for everybody who's on the West Coast here in the United States. Um, my name is Katie J. Scott. I'm the Executive Director of IACT, and um, today I'll be talking a little bit about Little Ripples, um, which is a refugee-led, child-centered, early childhood development and education program that's really grounded and integrates mindfulness and well-being. It's play-based, um, it's culturally adapted by the local community, and it incorporates health and hygiene into the curriculum. Um, we work in some of the most challenging places around the world. Um, so today I'm gonna specifically talk about CHAD because it's one of the most remote and disconnected um, settings that, that you could probably work in. Um, and that being said, um, I'm going to start with some messages from our colleagues um, who live and work in Chad in Darfur refugee camps. So if you can start the video, thanks. بالنسبة للمدارس دارين المساعدة المساعدة دي أن بساعد ممكن ما قصروا لكن أنينا دا الزروب ما بساعدنا لو نعمل شنو نجر جايكو الزروب ده لأنينا دي بيجي لنا صعب ما بساعدنا شديد وأنينا نشكر عليكم كثير ما قصرتوا وحسكوا لأن ما يقصركوا Little Rappel, this include a lot of childs, and those childs, they learn education and farms and uh, how to treat each other. They exactly learn the behavior and how to be a good leader. This is the inside of, of, uh, of education. Also in health, I have uh, made a program that uh, protect the refugees from the germs. That means he teach how to calf and, and how to grade the each other. For this, uh, the, the good thing that I asked did before the coronavirus, the people learn it how to protect from them, uh, from uh, from uh, how to protect themselves from the COVID-19 or from any germs. <laughs> فنشكر لمنظمة أي آت عمر لنا سنادر أي المعلمات والطباخات كثير وما في منظمة أي الطباخ أي النساء كثير زي منظمة أي آت فنشكر دائما لمنظمة أي آت وفي لنا يبني لنا سنادر عشان ما يأي النساء كثير وني نزات عندنا قدرة استقلوا زي ما رجال شخالين سويا وشكرا. This كام uh, just it became the first camp that I have established the little rappel here. Those children, they learn new behaviors, that behaviors which it led them to join all the people together, to come like one together. Uh, this also, uh, you know, it brought all the people to understand each other because they are reading the situation of each other. They like, they love each other because they live together all the time. Thank you. If you want to move it to the next slide, that'd be great. 
Um, so I act, um, our approach um, really was prepared for something like COVID. Um, it's really grounded in community. It begins with building trust and listening to the needs of the local community and then co-creating the curriculum, the daily program, um, and the activities that the teachers will do with the children during the teacher trainings and with, with the teachers in the local community themselves so that it's not only sustainable, but that it makes sense and is culturally appropriate. Um, we're deeply connected to the communities and we connect um, our refugee leaders in the different nations that we work in um, through WhatsApp um, during regular times, but then definitely also during, during COVID times. And then IAC's model is to not leave any foreign staff on the ground, which gives a real opportunity for um, local community members from the refugee camp themselves to lead every aspect of the program. So they have um, agency and voice and decision-making power. Um, and then IAC's model is to provide paid ongoing support. Um, and then during COVID-19 cash assistance um, where local decision-making was made um, on the ground in the camps about what, uh, where to spend that money and what was the greatest need and that varied between our communities. Um, next slide, please. So the thread throughout all of the Little Ripples programs in all of our countries is really peace, helping, and sharing. These are our pillars. Um, and these were what also informed um, our COVID-19 pre-primary solution. Uh, and then we have a very simple motto that we try to reinforce through teacher training and reinforce um, now through um, home-based learning um, by parents, which is if children are safe, and this is socially and emotionally, um, physically safe, and they're having fun, there's laughter, there's games involved, then learning will happen. Learning happens through that play itself and not separate from. Um, and so when we're talking about peace, we're also talking about inner peace. Um, so grounding activities in well-being, not just of the children, um, but also of the entire family. And when we were in school, the entire classroom center. So it's inner peace, but it's also outer peace um, in the setting. Student behavior management is all grounded in positive asset-based um, communication. Uh, and then providing opportunities as a group to settle, um, settle your emotional um, system, to, to self-regulate the emotions that come up as a community, um, which my colleagues and Chad referenced in the video. Um, helping and sharing, these translated really nicely um, to, the, to a COVID-19 solution. And that really engagement with your children um, through play and through your daily routine can lead to learning. Um, and then sharing is not just sharing physical resources, which we do a lot of in places like Eastern Chad because there's such few resources, but also having an opportunity for children who've been attending Little Ripples to share what they know and lead their parents or older siblings through mindfulness activities or through play-based learning. Um, next slide, please. So some of our um, COVID-19 response tools, um, teachers instantly became frontline workers. Um, because all of our programs are led by the community themselves, they really were equipped with the leadership skills already um, through our teacher training and our Lead with Empathy Leadership and Human Rights curriculum that they lead on their own in small circles. Uh, we did equip all of the leaders through WhatsApp. Um, WhatsApp is currently being blocked in Chad by the government, but on the onset of COVID, we did have regular access to WhatsApp. Um, and so equipping the leaders with um, how for them to stay safe and modeling check-ins, um, us checking in with them, um, then helps them embody checking in with the families. So staying safe during, for being, being a leader and staying safe during coronavirus was a really important tool for us to um, communicate to the leaders that their well-being is as important as the well-being of the, of the families that they were checking in on. Um, our staying safe at home flyer, um, they did print them. Not all of our community members um, necessarily read Arabic. So it was a lot of communication, um, like you'll see in the picture doing home visits. Um, and what they really communicated was a daily routine that was grounded in place. So it's suggestions on activities that family members are already doing. Um, and then offering an opportunity for the child to lead some of those, um, for the child, for the, for the parent to ask interactive questions. Um, it offered the three, three mindfulness and grounding activities that the students were already used to in our Little Ripple centers. Um, and then encouraging parents to ask the children to lead them themselves um, or come up with activities themselves. And then reiterating to the parents that if your home is safe, um, and this is again, emotionally uh, and physically safe, 
and you're having fun and you're engaging your child, then, then learning will happen, especially at that age group. That secure connection um, with a responsive adult really lays the platform for social and emotional um, development, cognitive development as they move forward in their lives. And then as um, COVID-19 drags on, as we know, um, we really do family, we really encouraged our leaders um, who were able to, to visit, um, to have family visits that encouraged um, and emphasized family whole being and engagement. So encouraging our leaders to um, engage the family in a mindfulness activity right there on spot to model engagement and responsive questioning of the child. What are you doing? What are you interested in? Um, at obviously an age appropriate level. So next slide, please. So key lessons learned um, that, we, that we've um, come to during COVID-19 times is that community leaders are really your greatest asset. Um, and if we can invest in community leaders prior to emergencies like COVID-19, even when you're in an emergency setting, not only does it empower them through having choice and decision-making power, um, but it prepares them for anything that might, for any uncertainty that might occur. Um, refugee communities already live in very unstable and uncertain times um, where they don't have a lot of choice in their lives. Um, so if we can really help facilitate opportunities for them to regain that choice and that dignity that's really lost in displacement, um, they become amazing leaders in their community. Agency, voice, and decision-making power is absolutely um, important, not only in, in the COVID-19 response, but in any community-based program. And as you're reopening and you're thinking about a reopening framework, the community members know what's going to work and what's not going to work in their community. Um, so we suggest um, instead of telling community members around the world what might work in their community, um, using questioning and critical thinking opportunities um, to share best practices that might be applicable to their setting, but also offering questions for them to problem solve what works in their own community. We found that personally checking in with your staff and encouraging self-care is vital during this time. Um, it models to them that, that they are centered in their own work, but then also to center children in the work as they move forward. Um, and then to underscore that social and emotional learning and whole family well-being must be a priority. Um, we, those things will lay the foundation for, for learning, for critical thinking, curiosity, exploring, all of these really key elements of learning through play. Um, so if we can help provide um, that safety and prioritize play, then learning will come. So thanks, Joan. Oops, you're on mute, Joan. We can't hear you. Several, sorry about that. Several questions are coming in, and I know Gabriel is, is uh, posting some answers specifically related to um, Little Ripples and IACT. I, I did want to point out there's a tremendous amount of interest being expressed about WhatsApp, and we've gotten some questions about um, establishing a learning group around WhatsApp. And if UNICEF collected any information in those fact sheets that I showed, we talked about, you know, it, it mentioned um, internet, it mentioned radio and television. And I don't know if someone from UNICEF could check to see if there was data collected on WhatsApp, but we'll come back to that. I want to turn from um, one region to another and move us to Latin America. And Brenda Campos will be presenting about Sesame Workshop. Brenda. Hi, everyone. Good morning from Mexico City. Um, so I'm Brenda Campos, and I'm a director for social impact for Sesame Workshop in Latin America. So I'll get into it. Um, next slide, please. please. OK, so just a quick reminder um, uh, and or a new information if you don't know about it. But Sesame Workshop, it's the NGO that leads all the work with Sesame Street, Plaza Sesamo in Latin America and in many other regions. We're in about 150 countries. And our mission is to help children grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. And uh, we've been in Latin America for the, uh, since 1972. So there's been many generations of children and now adults who've grown on uh, Sesame's content and learning uh, on TV. So that just as a, as a bit of a background. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, during the COVID pandemic and when it started at Sesame, we launched uh, Caring for Each Other as our initiative 
to support families, children, educators, and partners through uh, this uh, pandemic. And in Latin America, the name was Cuidándonos el uno al otro, which really built on this presence we've been in, in the region for so many years. And what is great is that because so many of us grew up on Sesame, we trust the content, and I talk about myself as well, but uh, caregivers trust the content, educators trust the content, and that they know that what we're producing is in the best interest of them and their children. And we were able to go um, into wide distribution through partners, and I'll get into that in a second. Next slide, please. So this is a snapshot so when the, of the content that we've been producing throughout these months. So when the pandemic first hit in March in Latin America, we needed to act very quickly. So it was great that we already had a huge repository of existing content that was useful, that promoted hand washing and healthy habits. Um, and since then, we've been clustering the content in three main priority areas. One is uh, understanding healthy health. It's within that, it's understanding the disease, how to take care of, uh, of yourself, how to prevent it, uh, all the hand washing and all the preventive behaviors, um, how to explain the disease to small children and, 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 and understand uh, how to stay healthy. The other uh, piece of, the other area of content was social emotional support, so how to cope with the disease, uh, how, um, how to manage and understand your emotions. And also for caregivers, how to um, promote mindfulness and be kind to themselves and understand uh, helping them cope with this and help their children cope with it. And learning from home, which is very heavily on uh, play-based learning, but all the, all the resources that we have to support learning, learning from home in, in many different areas. So the map below is just a snapshot on how we've been adapting the content as a, as a COVID, uh, pandemic has evolved. So anytime there's new evidence on, for example, masks, when people start, when we needed to start promoting masks, we just developed quickly content that promoted uh, people to wear masks, etc. So it's just been a very quick and fast paced the content development process. And we're mapping what will be the next months ahead. And you may know this, but in Latin America, schools are closed for the rest of the foreseeable future. So we really need to take a stand on how, what the kind of content we needed to be uh, promoting and distributing. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, we really work through an ecosystem of uh, platforms to really get to children, whatever they are, right? So in, through this pandemic, we've reached over 44 million people in 14 countries in Latin America. Through, this is important, through partners, platforms, including ministries of health, ministries of education, and large NGOs and other partners, including UNICEF, uh, and, um, and our own platforms. And I'll get into, into details, but this is just to get you a sense of, it's really an ecosystem of platforms in which we distribute the content we've been producing and made it available for partners in the region. Next slide, please. So I'll go, uh, uh, into some of these platforms. So TV, and we saw in the initial presentation how TV, ha how television has played a key role during this pandemic. And for us, it took us back to our origins when we first developed educational TV for, for preschoolers. And through, it has been, to an extent, a great opportunity for us to distribute our content in this particular moment, because ministries of education throughout the region are using television as a key platform to reach like at home uh, education uh, with millions of children. So we partner with the Inter-American Development Bank and we're distributing more than a thousand episodes uh, of TV, including content related to STEM learning, healthy habits, uh, digital literacy, uh, executive functions, and so many, many, many content um, that is being distributed right now through TV in the region, mostly public televisions linked to ministries of education. Next slide, please. WhatsApp. And I've heard uh, there's a lot of, a, a big conversation going on about WhatsApp, but I'll share with you the three ways in which we've been using WhatsApp so far. And similar to the rest of the world, WhatsApp is everywhere. And it's a core way in which people communicate and share media right now. So the first uh, strategy that we launched was WhatsApp chatbot. So this is an automated 
uh, chat response system in which if you send a code, uh, if you send your, your register the, the phone and send a, a text, you will get this menu. And based on this menu, you can get whatever you ask for. So videos, parenting tips, play at home activities, um, just fun content. And, um, and we, uh, so it's very interactive and it's user based, so they get whatever they ask for. And, um, and we upload and update this content regularly, so people are getting different content each time. And going into the second strategy, what we did is that we linked the chatbot with our TV content. So if you've seen the image there, you'll see uh, there's a phone number on the TV screen. So basically, if you're watching an episode of Sesame uh, in Latin America and you see this number, you text a specific code that is only for that episode. So the WhatsApp will send you back an idea of a play activity or something to do at home or another media piece that is related to the episode. So the idea is that you deepen the, the learning and make it more interactive. So it's TV now linked to the WhatsApp chatbot. And the third piece is that we created these content bundles that for each topic that we determined, we had a parenting tip, a play at home activity, a learn from home activity, sorry, and a, and a video or a media piece. Uh, similar to what uh, UNICEF was, Jordan was presented, that those three pieces of content were launched on the same day. But the way we distributed this through our own WhatsApp groups, which we have in throughout the region on, as part of our social impact programs, but also we provided these bundles of content to all our partners in the region. So large networks of governments uh, are distributing these like pieces of bundles of content through their own WhatsApp networks at the local levels. So we really gave it out to partners for them to use and distribute. Next slide, please. Online platforms, uh, it's just a, as a repository of the content. We use our sesamo.com website and we offer free learning and fun resources for children, caregivers, and practitioners. So guides, parenting guides, all types of, of content. And all of our video libraries are available on YouTube. And we use also social media as a key way to engage with caregivers directly. And we provide this content to partners so they can use throughout the platforms, as we can see here some examples from UNICEF and, and hospitals in Mexico, like many others in the region. Next slide, and just to finish. Um, so, I just want to share this because it's exciting. So Jardin Sesamo is an innovation we're launching in Latin America, particularly with migrants, Venezuelan migrants, and uh, in Colombia, Brazil, Peru. And the idea is that we, create, we have this device that you just plug in into electricity, and it will launch a local Wi-Fi signal for uh, people in shelters uh, throughout the migrant route. And in those shelters, they are, or these spaces, they're able to connect to Sesame's content and use it on their phone without data, without the need for them to have a connection to internet or, or any sort. So it's very light content, but the idea is to provide some resources throughout along the way. And we're testing it right now. Um, so I'll keep you posted on how that goes. And the last slide, and this will be 10 seconds. Um, just for you know, if there's anybody, the last slide, please. Uh, if there's anybody from Latin America in uh, on the webinar, please know that uh, we offer this content that is available for all our partners to be distributed and used in the work that they are already doing. And and that's it. I'll wrap up there. Thank you. <laughs> A lot right. of that was great, Brenda. We um, I see that caring for each other links are being posted. Uh, for you as you speak. And I think we're gonna get a lot of questions about that second to the last slide about Hadeen. So we'll come back to that um, in the Q&A. But I wanna now turn to uh, our colleagues from the Ukraine UNICEF office, Tatiana Kazanji and Olga Dolinina, who will be talking about their work um, in the Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to start and um, Olga will continue. So initially, we was, I'm CFD officer, communication for development officer here in our office in country office in Ukraine. So I'm going to tell you about our experience with um, learning at home campaign for preschoolers. Initially, we were supposed to launch an April campaign on quality for school education, a little bit different one, and absolutely another one agenda and the plans, but in March, we were first to put on pause everything, although everything was ready. 
and we understood that we need to support the resilience of parents uh, to break the um, the isolation and uh, to build the and support the results of parents and um, to support with useful content and to reduce risk of domestic violence that could happen when everyone is sitting at home. So in the state of Ukraine, we're allowed a digital activation, uh, 15 days, we call it 50 days on learning at home, on raising awareness about possible activities that can be done with children at home and by practicing these activities. Uh, during the outbreak, children continue to develop different uh, skills and th that skills that they had to have while they are going to the preschooler facilities, such as physical, cognitive, social, emotional, and etc. So therefore, activation contributes to healthy environment and children can learn how to play and to learn at home uh, from their parents. So as you may see right now, you can see the floor. And I will explain every step and how we gain uh, our goals. So campaign targeted parents, uh, of course, and caregivers is a and in the, at home taking care of their children. And of course, educators, because they also need needed support from our side and from Ministry of Education side, because they need some guidance how to help children, because that's absolutely different one case, not the same as um, with uh, uh, students in school. Uh, so we, and to practice, at least try to practice remote preschooling or find a way how to support children and parents. So um, we were starting with the first lady. We understood that we need a big push uh, from uh, such a big uh, influencer uh, in terms of country. So we negotiated with the first lady and uh, we, she supported our initiative and we draw attention and uh, we draw a lot of attention here with her post. So we reached out first lady and we're lucky to get your um, acceptance and we to move forward with this campaign and that she's gonna support us using your channels. I mean here, not only social media, but your influence to uh, mom's community and parents community. So she supported activity until the very end. And then, then we understood that we need more than her is gonna be uh, opinion leaders that can um, take one uh, specific skill and to inspire people to repeat this skill um, within their homes. And we divided all of these 15 activities between these 15 uh, opinion leaders. Please uh, go with the next slide. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. And um, uh, we divided activities between these opinion leaders. And we also were very careful with their selection because they should be aligned with the UNICEF guidance and our policies so it was from different sides some of them were bloggers some of them were singers uh, publishers and etc and uh, then every person did uh, one video on their social media account usually it was instagram and they, in, in the end of their video they were telling about learning at home campaign about hashtag and saying and uh, encourage people to repeat the same at home to send their videos and to use this tag so we would be able to see who has joined to the activation so please with the next slide, slide. Okay, thank you. And we also do realize that uh, only one activity explained in 30 on one minute video is not enough. So we were thinking about develop some useful EC materials for parents and for, care for caregivers. So we identified from, uh, with a big support from our regional office, what kind of information material this could be. And we uh, adapted them to Ukrainian context and reality. And then uh, we also um, were review this with our Ministry of Education and Science because uh, all of these uh, activation were done jointly with Ministry of Education and Science. They supported us also from the very beginning. And we are, were very happy that, they, that, we got to, that we got it back very uh, immediately from their side. And we develop uh, videos, you can see a lady right now. So we made, we should two videos uh, from uh, our IP that explain 
what kind of approach you should identify while you are taking care of child at home and trying to learn him. Another one was dedicated what kind of uh, useful activities you can do at home. And also there was a coloring book, thanks to our colleague in Latin America, we adopted it to Ukrainian context. Now you also see it in the right corner. And also it was uh, um, some series of visuals, which we, you see this lady yoga doing, uh, lady doing yoga. So we cropped the content on that visual for many cards. So we had a lot, uh, like a 40 cards and we use them to incorporate in Facebook and Instagram, then people will be able to get a very short text and to identify what kind of these tips is relevant to his very or her very case. And also there were uh, two guidance for educators. And we have uh, negotiated with Ministry of Education that all of this content will be disseminated through Viber um, in Ukraine, it's not WhatsApp is not that popular. Here we are like a bit different. The Viber is the main uh, messenger here, and then Facebook and Telegram on the on, our, on other places. So we dealt with ministries that uh, Viber they're gonna disseminate among Viber groups with educators and um, on ministry of website. So we were aware that every preschool facility could get this information. And extra one thing that we have done, we arrange a Q&A live stream session with a very popular psychologist here and put post US country, her name is Flana Royce. So we have, we collected all questions from parents right above the all post dedicated to learning home campaign. And then in a live uh, format, ask you everything. And uh, people were also able to ask the equation during this session and to get their answers. Next slide, please. The last, I think, almost the last one. And the last thing is a social mobilization because the main goal of these activities was to mobilize people to get them involved to what kind of uh, activities they can practice at home with children while preschool facilities are closed. And of course, it's unlikely from school, you cannot uh, ask three years old children sit in, in front of laptop and do um, repeat all everything that a teacher is doing on the other side of uh, laptop. So we do understand that we have to find uh, a different approach and we have to motivate people taking um, participant in this uh, activation. So we develop a uh, entertainment kit right now you see that one in the blue picture. It was a board game dedicated to hygiene practices that we developed previously for our wash activities here in Ukraine for the uh, conflict affected uh, Ukraine so we use that and also a coloring book uh, dedicated to hygiene practicing and prevention measures and as well as book on coronavirus and from a very famous British with a very famous British illustrator and we the first uh, 100 families who took part in our campaign and sent the videos tagging us have got uh, these education kits and the next slide I want to share with you our key uh, learnings and uh, key goals and results so we were lucky to involve almost 6 million people from 40 million people living in Ukraine to take part in this activity, which is a quite high as we think. And 15 celebrities, if to count all of their followers who reacted somehow on these videos, were around 9 million people, were 9 million people. So video were seen, were viewed almost 1 million times. And the most uh, viral content on Ministry of Education social media accounts during the whole pandemic was the content from UNICEF of, about uh, learning at home campaign. But what we have to keep in mind for the next activity is that during pandemic times, all of celebrities trying to produce they own very useful content that's why you are like taking part in competition and it was very hard to draw attention to your very content and sometimes we feel like a lack of attention of people and it was very challenging to draw it and also a general fatigue of people to consume even more information everything was very useful from every source so this slide was a bit complicated as well and what it was good is a collaboration with ministry and with the first lady it gives the it was very very fruitful for us and we do understand this every next campaign we should do this as well so it's over and please all continue
Thank you. Thank you, thank you Tatiana. I'm Olga Delinian, Education Officer, UNICEF uh, Ukraine Office. And uh, yeah, I, can, I want to say that new COVID reality just confirmed to us that our parents and caregivers are absolutely not ready to uh, ensure to continue the access to preschool education, unfortunately. That is a big stress for them and they lack capacity and also resilience, as well as our, our preschool educators. And um, that's why uh, we, we decided that all the materials that we developed under the campaign and also additionally as a response to COVID, just to put at some one place to save it and have it, to disseminate it and share further, have a stock uh, at the Learning Passport platform uh, that was organized in, in Ukraine. And we created a special page for preschool education dedicated exactly. Next slide, please. And uh, we see that um, the demand for the uh, resources on preschool education is really high. And uh, in Ukraine, uh, the, uh, the situation, the, the quarantine is becoming less uh, stricted. And then preschool were opened since May. And uh, still, uh, we don't know the situation. We don't know what the situation is going to happen tomorrow, in a month, in a three months. That's why we definitely need to know, need to prepare for the situation in case the parents can, uh, or even educators can uh, use it afterwards during the second wave or like on parallel just to add up their uh, the education um, system and, uh, and program as well. So as a result, we created at the Learning uh, Passport platform, Ukrainian edition, the page dedicated only for the preschool where we put some videos, publications, guidance, tips, all the information that could be useful for the parents during their learning at home. So it's, uh, there are some information how to develop social, emotional, cognitive um, competencies and skills of uh, children at home. Uh, how to be mindful, how to be healthy, mindfully, when you are, you are stuck during the quarantine at home with a child and at the same time to develop and understand your responsibility as a parent to work and support your child and also to support uh, psychologically yourself and also to uh, help to relieve the stress of a child. And there are like a lot of, lot of tips for the uh, parents and educators. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, please. And for the parents, uh, where, uh, can you please return? Uh, uh, for the parents, we have the, the examples of the video, how to, be, how to make a positive parenting during the COVID, how some example, how to talk with the children about the COVID, some uh, hygiene practices, some uh, useful tips. Next, please. And also some videos for the children, how to make hand washing, how to, uh, some tips for the parents, how to relax uh, with children at home, and many, many more resources and guidance and tips that can be used during the pandemic, the second wave, or it could be used uh, for the post-recovery stage as additional resources or for the even educators when they conduct um, their session. Next, please. And also, as a result, we saw the great opportunity also for, for now to, uh, to use uh, the, the, the crisis, the pandemics, to raise the awareness of the parents about their role, their responsibility of developing their children at home. Uh, and nevertheless, if there is a system working or not, to ensure the access to education. As a result, we, uh, we are in the process of finalizing, creating 20 animation videos, one video, one video, uh, one skill for the parents and educators to facilitate learning at home on creativity and self-identification, civic skills, self-help skills, speaking skills, all possible skills. So the parent can get one video and one skill in order to, to, um, to work with children. Next, please. And uh, another thing that we would like even to, prom to, um, to update it more, we are finalizing the mobile application for the learning passport that can be also used offline. So in case if there is no inter internet in the rural area or conflict affected settings or emergencies where there is no internet, parents can upload all the videos, information, publications on the phone and use it uh, as offline. Uh, all these uh, activities and guidances and everything. Uh, thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Tatiana and Olga. Um, I think it was a great example of bringing on new champions to work uh, on behalf of children. And I, there's uh, a posting of the, for the learning passport if people want to 
um, download that. And I just want to reinforce a, t a point that Tatiana made before I turn it over to some questions about the reality that we can't expect preschool children be to be sitting in front of screens hours on end. We used to work to limit screen time and now we're faced with this. So we've got to balance that. Um, I, I'm going to turn to Charlotte for some questions, but I also want to have the panelists think about and share with us any efforts you've made along the way to reach out to parents with children with disabilities, because I think those families are under particular stress. Charlotte, any questions coming in while the panelists think about that? Hi, Joan. Yeah, lots of questions coming in. Um, I'm conscious of time, so we might want to keep this Q&A quite brief so we have a, a wider discussion. One that's come up a lot um, in different formats um, is really recognising the amazing role that um, digital tools are providing at the moment, but also some concerns around the digital divide. Recognition that WhatsApp is playing an amazing role, but that not everyone has access to that. Um, so just a, a request perhaps to the panelists to just to share some reflections around sort of reaching communities um, with a, with, without these resources. And what alternative solutions can we, can we look to? And I'm conscious that um, Brenda mentioned some exciting work that is underway. Um, and I know Katie J, you've been working in, in contact, really low resource context. So perhaps we could come to, to Brenda and Katie J first on that question. Please join us, the other panelists, with your video. Yeah, so for, for us working in, in low tech contexts that are very, very remote, um, it was important and a central part of our program to really equip and um, provide the opportunity for leaders to lead, for teachers to think of themselves as leaders even prior to COVID, so that when COVID struck, they really felt like they had the capacity to reach out to family members. Um, family engagement was already a key part uh, of Little Ripples and of our um, other children-based um, activities in the refugee camps. Um, and so encouraging them to go and visit face-to-face, -face, that's really the, the most simplified, low-tech, um, relationship-based connection that's possible um, in the refugee settings that takes a long time. It's, the refugee camps are huge. Um, it's also a key part of, of feeling like you're very isolated and disconnected. So it serves a purpose beyond just the information that they're sharing, but it serves that purpose of personal connection, which then um, the adults who are being personally connected to create that responsive connection with their children as, as a form of modeling it. So person to person. <laughs> And in, in our case, so we, we are not implementers per se, we do implement some projects, but we really rely on implementing partners. And this could go through governments, ideally, because then we can scale, but all types of organizations. Um, but in this case, the Hardin Sesama piece is how could we deploy our content uh, to settings where no internet connection and, and very uh, remote. Uh, so we, as I said, we're testing this device and it's very like, easy to use is you're just connected to the to the electricity that's all and it sends a local signal so the idea is that we we did an assessment an initial assessment with uh, the migrant uh, situation in Colombia coming from Venezuela to understand uh, the needs and and we understand that there's very little resources for for small children well for preschoolers and and and, and younger children so it's how could we deploy some of this content uh, through the, the systems that are already in place. Like UNICEF has like uh, migrant shelters throughout the route and other partners like NRC and others. So how could we work with them through their infrastructure to deploy this content? And it's very simple to use. And, and we understood also that families carry a cell phone. Most of them do, or at least one cell phone uh, per family sometimes, but they don't have data. Uh, data plans. So it's how, but so this Wi-Fi connection works without data plans, and they'll be able to access this content. Um, we did some initial testings, and now we're uh, growing the testing, and we'll we hope to get some results and, and huge learnings. I'm sure we'll, we'll learn a lot before we can, uh, further scale. I think a lot of people are going to be interested in that, Brenda. So we'll have to come back in a few months and have you report yeah. back. Um, I want to just move us on to Marco and Kevin, but I do want to see if there's anyone that can respond to the question around disabilities. So it's something for us to think about. Yeah. Yeah. 
I can I can give some example from our side while there were pandemic like in the during the outbreak phase, uh, but it was not for preschoolers. It was for students of schools. So we did uh, schooling through TV, and we used um, gesture. A person who was uh, uh, repeating everything on the screen with gesture language, and also the subtitles for children who are cannot attend school during the outbreak, but to be on the board with the process of learning. So in Ukraine case, it worked because it was uh, was uh, broadcasted through TV. Everyone, like 99% of Ukrainians have TV at home. So it worked for them. At mm -hmm. least it was the easiest way to deliver knowledge to children in that way with disability. Uh, yeah, John, I, want, I wanted to say also for disabilities, I think the little, the little silence after your question is also emblematic of, or symptomatic of the really lack of, of good responses or, or, in, or inadequate responses. And maybe Sajida, who is our expert also on, on uh, early childhood de development and disabilities, can say something. But uh, during, during COVID-19, and particularly in the refugee camps in, uh, in uh, Jordan, uh, the Syrian refugee camps, and you probably know there is... A, a, a more than a million re a Syrian refugees in Jordan, 20% uh, of them in refugee camps. We did have uh, home visits to continue uh, the support of children with disabilities. But again, this is uh, it's, it's almost an uh, it's almost like an anecdotal intervention that is really not at the scale. We we can concentrate in the camps because it's so much so much more manageable, and we were able uh, of having those permissions basically uh, that uh, uh, didn't violate the lockdown uh, because everybody was locked down. So we did, we did have people who had like, speech therapy and, and, and some interventions so we could, were able to continue in you know, a few hundreds of those visits, but certainly not, not enough. And uh, so Joan was talking to me on the, on the chat saying, we did train some of the facilitators on being, being um, cognizant, aware that they were going to deal with children with disabilities. And obviously, surprise, surprise, we, we have several of them. And we also deal with parents with disabilities and how to help those to help their, their children. Uh, certainly not enough. We don't have good tools for early identification. Uh, but it's not that we are not aware of it, but we are not equipped, we are, we are not prepared really to have um, robust responses, I will say. Well, and thank you. We for, have to be very self-critical of that. Yeah, we have to all remember that. So I'm going to, this is an amazing conversation, but I'm going to turn to our last two speakers to give us important comments there from the Global Education Cluster, Marco Gracia and Kevin Nascimento, um, to talk about guidance in reopening preschool and other issues. So Marco, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, evening, everyone. So my name is Marco Grazia, and I work as a director for the Child Protection and Education in Emergency Technical Unit of World Vision. I represent World Vision in INE student group, and I recently joined also the INE Early Childhood Development and Emergency Task Team. I also sit in the strategic advisory group of the Global Education Cluster, and it is it is from this intersection between INE and the Global Education Cluster that today I'm happy to present along with my colleague Kevin Nesimiento of Plan International, the technical annex to the safe back to school guidance that provides additional consideration for early learning programs. So I will spend a few words on the safe back to school guidance, and then I will provide some insight in the technical annex itself, and then I'll leave the floor to Kevin to complement and add more on the technical annex itself. So the safe back to school guidance is an interagency document that many agencies that belongs to INE, but also are sitting in the global education cluster strategic advisory group designed in early May, to respond to the need to have a practitioner guidance to orient the process of reopening the schools. So initially it was translated in three languages, English, French, and Spanish, but now through the link that I provided in the chat box, you can have even more translation uh, through the webpage of INE. 
the guidance is not a policy document. So it builds on the UN framework for reopening schools that gives the policy framework for this process, but provide give a concrete actions that can be taken at community and school level to operationalize the global policy recommendation. It does not set any standard, but it refers to the existing humanitarian standard. And in particular, this is important for this webinar, I, I want to highlight it. Uh, the group that developed the guidance uh, used the INE minimum standard and domains to map out the content of the document and ensure that the INE minimum standard were fully applied. This document and all the annexes, including the annex that I'm presenting today, along with Kevin, were designed with a multi-sectoral approach in mind. And in particular, we look at health, nutrition, wash, monitoring evaluation, education, child protection, and MHPSS. And, and it's evident that this multi-sectoral or holistic approach is even more relevant when programming for early childhood development and education. The guidance is divided in two main sections. One, uh, it's comprised two uh, checklists, an integrated six pages of checklists that provide key action for integrated approach to reopen school before and after the schools re will reopen. And then a school-friendly safe back to school checklist. It, this is a two-pager providing top line action for a head teacher or community school community to follow. And uh, the, the, um, the format of this second checklist is very much reflected in the technical annex we are presenting today. <clears throat> in addition, there are eight technical annexes that dig deeper in certain aspects touched in the checklist. So we look at, for example, participatory inclusive back to school campaign, education technical solution for absentee management system, uh, support to teacher in transition to back to schools, MHPSS for children as schools reopen, participatory education and continuity planning, adaptation for camp setting, advocacy messages, and finally the key consideration for early childhood development we, that we are presenting now. Um, it is also important, and Kevin will explore this more, that uh, within the checklist and within the the different technical annexes, we are also referencing many resources that all the organizations that contributed to this uh, effort uh, put together and made available for uh, public access. Uh, the guidance is endorsed by the Global Education Cluster and the Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility. And as I said, it was a product of the group of NGOs working within the strategic advisory group of uh, the global education cluster, including INE. While the, the guidance was designed to cover all possible contexts for delivering education, the technical annex we are presenting today intends to focus on three key challenges in the process of reopening early learning centers. So first of all, how to prevent COVID-19 transmission with young children that are probably less able to sneeze or cough in a elbow, that cannot endure or should not wear a mask if they are under two years old, or cannot keep social and physical distances. The other focus is how to organize small group learning with the often limited human and physical resources available. And finally, how to support home learning consideration and the role of the parents in early childhood development in general, and in particular under these pandemic circumstances. So obviously the technical annex is a two pager, so it might not address all the key challenges that uh, we are focusing on, but provides a practical example, practical suggestion on how to deal with these three specific challenges. If you can go to the next slide, please. I'll try to give you some example of key consideration for early learning program managers or administrator, and I will leave to Kevin to continue with other uh, type of suggestion for other education actors. For example, one of the key suggestions is to prepare the reopening plan with parents. And this is an essential element grounded on the foundational domain of INE minimum standard for community participation. A successful process for reopening early childhood 
programs cannot leave aside an active engagement of family, especially considering the role they play at home with their own children. And we have heard from uh, the previous panelists uh, how important it is to engage and support parents and families in uh, delivering early childhood programs. Another uh, recommendation looks at a measure to improve adult child ratio for physical distancing. Again, here we clearly refer to the any minimum standard for access and learning environment, and we suggest solutions to address staffing gaps, for example, training community uh, volunteers, use alternative community spaces, and again, here it's clear the reference to the community participation foundational domain of any minimum standard, or again, using staggered shift for access to spaces. Also, the increased use of uh, outdoor space and, um, and learning time because the risk of infection is much lower outside while ensuring that there are standard safety measures in place. Finally, another important element linked with the INM minimum standard for teaching and learning, but also with the teachers and other education personal standard is related to the support of the teacher in creating positive classroom management, MHPSS, safeguarding social emotional learning. And this goes along as well with the recommendation to ensure teachers do not feel pressured to catch up in literacy and numeracy. I think I've seen in the, Q&A, a question about why to focus so much on literacy and numeracy, and especially in the first phase of reopening early childhood program, it's really important that uh, teachers do not feel pressured to focus on, on those elements. And uh, obviously, uh, again, connected with the I need minimum standard for teachers and other education personnel, the important uh, compensation for the additional hours that uh, staff has to spend working on the process of reopening school. This, is, has, this has a cost implication, and uh, obviously uh, there are uh, advocacy messages that might be addressed to the donors on that. And uh, because of this, the Global Education Cluster also recently issued a donor brief for safe back to school COVID-19 that can be used to advocate for adequately fund the process of reopening school. And this is available at the moment in English and in Arabic. So um, I will leave to Kevin maybe to continue in providing more example of the suggestion and recommendation we have for uh, in the in the Tanikin Annex. Thank you. Thanks, Marco. Uh, yeah, so I'll continue on and discuss some considerations or examples for ELP staff, caregivers that we have, we're working with in ECD centers. Um, so first and foremost, we're looking at the I need new standards for trying to divide the class into smaller groups for physical distancing. Um, we're going to try and see, and we'll probably see, um, as we've seen also in Plan International, um, events where teacher, the script of kind of chorus teaching and teaching um, in front of the classroom has shifted into more student-centered learning uh, due to these smaller groups of children. Um, and this kind of ties into the second point of organizing materials typically recyclable materials or materials that you have into kits um, and, you know, making sure that these kits are recycled, um, recyclable, apologies, or clean before and after use uh, within these small groups. Um, looking at trying to see if we can't <clears throat> uh, work with these children in the smaller groups. And additionally, we're looking at trying to promote uh, children's uh, well-being and social emotional learning. Um, and I just want to take a moment. Um, I know uh, Joanne asked about uh, working with children with disabilities or uh, dis people with disabilities in general. And I kind of want to highlight as well um, girls and marginalized groups in general. Um, I know the return to school provides an opportunity to bring girls, uh, children with disabilities that were out of school before the pandemic uh, into school reopening plans as well. Um, so we're looking at trying to provide teachers and school officials with appropriate training to manage confidential discussions with girls who have might have experienced or been affected by violence during school closures, uh, working on developing these kind of MHPSS referral systems, and updating school-based reporting and referral mechanisms uh, to ensure gender and age responsiveness um, and develop developmentally appropriate and inclusive support for PSS. Um, we can also use stories and songs and activities to promote good hand washing and respiratory hygiene. 
know there's a slew of information and resources uh, around that and I'll touch base on that uh, within two slides uh, regarding, for example, Ahlan Simpson with hand washing. Um, in addition, recognizing that young children may be experiencing psychological distress through changes in their behavior. Um, this age group in particular, they're not going to be as vocal about, you know, having experienced uh, difficulties at home if they've experienced difficulties at home. Um, so recognizing and depending on your teachers that have worked with these children before in the past or caregivers that have worked with these children in the past to really ensure that any changes in behavior are not brushed aside and really take advantage of, you know, taking a child aside through appropriate trainings and referral mechanisms um, and really uh, seeing um, if this behavior requires any further referrals. Um, and as Marco alluded to as well, uh, following a regular schedule for contacting families about home learning, you know, parents are going to be uh, key components and key actors um, in children's return to the school, quite particularly girls' education, knowing um, as well uh, how oftentimes there's a bit of a, despite gender uh, parity, a lack of gender equality. Um, and then, as Katie J mentioned, actually, in her, in her presentation, uh, teachers at the start of COVID-19 became frontline workers. So identifying and linking caregivers in high distress uh, to MHPSS services, knowing full well that we're putting a lot of uh, effort, uh, we're putting a lot of uh, work on the shoulders of caregivers that they themselves have their own families to manage um, and are within the same context of uh, families that are trying to figure out the best way to return to school um, and might be afraid of their own uh, health when, you know, groups of children, especially in some classrooms that have 80 plus children, 100 plus children in it, uh, making sure that we're taking care of our uh, ELP staff and our caregivers as best as possible. Next slide, please. And then ultimately, uh, the last part, and this is kind of just a rehash now that we've talked through all the other presenters, uh, considerations for parents and caregivers, ensuring children do not bring items from home unless necessary, um, making sure that we're not trying to mix um, anything from the household into school, uh, and only one person dropping up and picking up the child from school. Um, I know myself, having seen ECD centers, um, worked in them many times, at the beginning of school and at the end of school, we see quite a number of people just entering through the gates. Um, we're trying to limit that a bit and making sure, uh, you know, that children and parents meet one another. And this really just kind of falls under a protection issue as well, uh, making sure that children are fine, their parents are uh, a proxy for the parent to make sure that they're picking up their children appropriately and not entering into the school grounds as much, really trying to limit the amount of people just getting into the school environment as much as possible. Um, and as we've uh, spoken about at length during this webinar, supporting young children's learning and psychosocial well-being at home. Um, I mean, I know myself, I'm quite interested now learning from uh, about Hardim Sesamo. We're looking at Aslan Simpson. We have a ton of things going, going really well, um, as we've just alluded to in this presentation. Something that we didn't really discuss in this guidance at this moment uh, was guidance for under threes in childcare. We know that childcare in under threes is um, quite challenging as a critical service at this moment. Uh, so definitely looking into trying to either uh, make an addendum to the technical annex or looking at under threes as uh, a separate annex to really focus on that childcare aspect that I know a lot of us uh, are quite interested in. And I know there's especially looking forward, uh, looking at girls and young mothers, looking at how best to balance all the responsibilities falling on their shoulders, all that unpaid caregiver work that uh, really goes unnoticed uh, when we're looking, when we're discussing back to school guidance. Next slide, please. So as Marco alluded to, um, we have a ton of resources that we've spoken about uh, in this technical annex and it's linked through the annex. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, I've put a few uh, links to the activities that we have from a multitude of organizations, UNICEF, SESAME, uh, Plan International, um, you name it. And I've highlighted the Spanish, French, Arabic, and Portuguese. Of course, we have uh, resources in English, but I'd like to focus on uh, these languages. Um, and for example, in Spanish, we have actividades and mindfulness for kids three to five years old, um, working, creating toys to uh, play around with. In French, we have Jouer à la maison. And then parents and caregivers resources. Of course, Arabic, we have the wonderful Ahlan Simpson series of videos. I know we're talking about the digital gap and the, especially the digital gender gap as well and trying to get uh, kids in front of those resources as best as possible. And Portuguese, we have Via Durma de Monica. So we have different resources for parents and givers and early learning staff resources that I encourage everyone to look at um, as you dive into this annex. 
Thanks very much. Well, a wealth of information. Thank you so much. I, I want to underscore a point that Marco made about asking parents what they need rather than us assuming that we know. And uh, Kevin, many things. So thank you so much for reinforcing the importance of linking with mental health. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really struck with so many of the principles that we believe in early childhood, limit screen time, bring things from home, parents should have free access, and we're having to reverse some of those things in the name of hygiene, good hygiene, and it's, it's, it's been difficult for early childhood people. One question that came in to the two of you is, where pre-primary has not been a priority, what are your recommendations? Kevin, it was or, never a priority. Or it was never a priority. Thank you. I mean, we can't, uh, we need to be promoting, and I'm glad you mentioned zero to three, learning begins at birth throughout the early childhood period. Any recommendations from you, especially during the pandemic? Marco or Kevin, you're both on mute, please. Marco. Well, just basically, uh... We recognize that we could not cover everything in such a short annex and within the framework of reopening school. So that was the, the main intent of the, of the safe to back to school guidance. So looking more at um, the process of reopening centers or schools that were obviously um, that uh, as uh, Eduardo said, uh, often forget or uh, do not prioritize zero to three. So in the guidance, there is not much uh, on that. Uh, as Kevin said, this is an area that we would like to, to work on with the group of uh, the INE task team for early childhood. This would be a wonderful platform to start engaging and suggesting and contributing to that. Uh, but I think one of the key aspects here is the multi-sectoral or holistic approach that should help us in, uh, in guiding all the possible um, recommendation for parents, caregivers, but also uh, practitioners and programming staff in looking at the, 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 the whole child and not just from an educational perspective, not just from a protection perspective, but, but from an holistic perspective. So Kevin, over to you if you wanna add more. Yeah, I think this came from uh, Dr. Lim uh from Nigeria. And it's interesting to actually to hear coming from Nigeria because similar uh, contexts are happening where pre-primary education isn't really focused on or isn't a priority. And I think that just has a lot honestly to do and it's a very fluid and not a great answer, but it has a lot to do with that advocacy and really chipping away at that, um, you know, at whether using your organization, which organization you work with, working with local education groups, the legs, working with education clusters to really promote that pre-primary education, finding funding for that pre-primary education. Um, the context is only so, so far as uh, where you're working and where your needs assessments are finding, whether or not it's a priority. So based on your own needs assessments, are you seeing gaps in that pre-primary education? If so, you know, if that's an adaptation of um, whether it's your organization as its own or really as a coalition or um, coming together under the local education groups of the clusters to really promote that uh, all the way up to you know the ministry of uh, general education um, or ministry of education services in nigeria well thanks kevin and thanks to everyone i we're almost out of time um it's been a very rich presentation i think we're all challenged now to move forward on the zero to three platform marco thank you um and turn to nurturing care framework which provides us, I think, the framework for moving that ahead. I wanna thank everybody. I also wanna just reinforce two messages, the importance of caring and the importance of kindness. Um, we can't be pushing children to fill them up with knowledge because they've been out of school. We really have to embrace their social emotional uh, needs and the social emotional needs of their families. Thank you, everybody. You're not working in this alone. We're all in this together. Thank you. And thanks, the planners. Have a good thanks day. Thanks to you too, Jim. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.